getting over a divorce is always difficult. In terms of emotional stress, it is said to be equivalent to losing a spouse. I actually think it's worse. I'm not a psychiatrist or a professional counselor, but I'm sure I'm right. Let's compare these two cases. When your spouse dies, you lose someone you lived with, loved, and were emotionally attached to for some time. After a divorce, exactly the same parameters apply. The difference is that when a spouse dies, whether due to illness, accident, or even intentional crime, you are not left with a crippling self-doubt that divorce brings. You don't spend months, even years, wondering why you weren't enough or why you weren't good enough for her. You don't spend a long time afraid to try again with someone else, purely out of fear that the same thing will happen. There is also the fact that when your spouse dies, you don't feel the pain of walking into your favorite cafe and seeing him with someone else. If you truly love this person, seeing this must be one of the worst feelings you have ever experienced. Anyway, my name is Jake Reed, and I'm just starting to get over my divorce. First, I must tell you that my divorce was not one of those bitter and drawn-out divorces where both parties scratch and fight for dominance and a larger share of the family assets. My divorce was the kind you rarely hear about. He was warm and caring and filled with a lot of love. I didn't divorce Sarah because I wanted to. I divorced her because she broke my heart and left me no other choice. Sarah seemed really sorry for cheating on me, but she knew what kind of person I was. I value loyalty above all else, and her betrayal was the end. As much as I loved her, I still needed to be able to look myself in the eye every morning and respect the face that looked back at me in the mirror. So when she slept with her boss, she also ruined any chance of us staying together. The child that came from their union only made the situation worse. Sarah, who refused to marry him after their affair and barely has anything to do with him, is not living well. It is not my fault. I pay my child support on time, and I'm actually a little ahead of schedule. In my profession, your reputation matters a lot, so I can't afford to be labeled as a neglectful father. Sarah is also very liberal when it comes to meeting rights. She never tried to stop me from seeing our daughter, who is now three years old. She allows me to see my daughter whenever I want to see her, but I still find it very difficult to go to Sarah's apartment. Every time I see her, I am reminded how much I loved her and how special she was to me. There's also the problem that no matter how polite we are to each other, everyone always assumes that I'm the bad guy here. Even people who know what really happened seem to think it's my fault. I assumed I should have just turned away and pretend nothing happened. Almost everyone I know seems to think that if your spouse cheated just once, that's acceptable. I should just say, okay, honey, you used your get out of jail free card. Now you really need to keep the promises you made to me. But if you can forgive it once, why can't you tolerate it twice? Maybe three times should be the limit. And then for some people with circumstances, you really need more options, right? No, this is not what I signed up for. I have never cheated on Sarah, and I would never do it. So, as much as I missed her, and as much as I loved her deep down, I had to say goodbye. In the end, it was her actions, not my refusal to accept them, that destroyed our family. I still buy her Christmas and birthday gifts without hesitation, and she does the same. She also buys me a gift for Father's Day, but I can't return the favor. Mother's Day is just really hard for me because her new baby always reminds me of what I lost and what we could have had. The worst thing of all happened when I picked up Tina, our daughter, to take her to the zoo a couple of months ago. Sarah's child followed my daughter all the time. I think this was expected since he is her half-brother. Anyway, Tina came up to me, hugged me, and wanted me to pick her up. Daddy, pick me up, she said. The boy, following her, came up behind her and also called me dad. I almost lost my composure. I hate leaving him behind when I take Tina. Although Sarah understands it, it's hard for her. I still hear from our mutual friends that she misses me and sometimes cries over our breakup, even though it's been over a year. For some reason, she also named her son Jake after me. She said it was her way of getting back at his father, and it had nothing to do with me. But in the end, it turned out the other way around. Her ex-boss just sends checks periodically and has almost nothing to do with the child. 
I think good-natured people think the baby had nothing to do with Sarah and I breaking up. But every time I look at him, I see the son I always wanted to have with Sarah and now will never have. What can I say, this is a really difficult situation. Over the past few weeks, I've realized that I need to get my head out of my ass and move on with my life. As much as I love Sarah, there is no going back. But I also thought it would be a good move for her too. If she saw that I was starting to date and going out on dates, maybe she would too. Tonight was pleasant, but strange. My date for the evening, Mildred Henderson, is a beautiful woman. She has classic features and beautiful blonde hair. She is very slim and short, but I kept comparing her to Sarah, and I found that she lost in every category. On paper Mildred is prettier than Sarah, but to me she's not even close. Even when I thought the date was over, she was ready to move on to extra innings. Surprisingly, I was the one who wasn't ready to take the next step tonight. I was sure it would be a while before I was ready to have sex with someone other than Sarah, but it would happen eventually. I just had to prepare for it. That's exactly what I was thinking as I drove my 2012 Mustang GT back to my condo. I liked the low roar of the car, and I liked looking through the hood with its powerful protrusion partially blocking my view. I also loved that the car had so much power that I was always just a fingertip away from getting a speeding ticket and an astronomical increase in insurance. Driving a Mustang has always been a little like being Spider-Man. Every time you get into a car, you remember that with great power comes great responsibility. In fact, buying this Mustang after my divorce was one of the things I did to restore my sense of confidence. I had others, but this one was the most powerful. I can only name two things that make me smile every time I see them. One of them is this car, and the other is my daughter. I locked the car and headed to my condo. Hearing the confident sound of the alarm going off, I knew my beauty would be safe from most of the dangers she might face while we were apart. Suddenly, a dark figure emerged from behind the potted trees at the entrance to my building. This car is a real beast, she said. In the shadows, I couldn't make out her features. I could tell she didn't mean to scare me, but it happened anyway. I guess I don't really remember how impressive and powerful it was, she said. You won't like this at all. I immediately perked up. I stepped away from her. I wasn't stupid enough to think that just because she was a woman I could beat her. She could have had a weapon or a stun gun for anything. I wanted to keep some distance between us just in case. While I was retreating, she was moving forward. And this woman you were with tonight, she continued. She's very interested, but it will never work, so call her and dump her. She's a really nice lady, I said. The problem was me. I'm probably just not ready to return to the social circle yet. The problem is that there's only one woman you'll ever be comfortable with, she said. Listen, lady, I replied sharply. Maybe you should let me run your own life. Maybe I can't do this, she said. Perhaps I know better than you what is good for you. I started laughing and wished her good night. Can we come in and talk about it? She asked. This is really not what I envisioned. In fact, I imagined that we would hug now or you would be shocked. You are crazy, I asked. I won't let some stranger come into my house. How stupid do you think I am? Very, she said. She stepped out of the shadows and in the moonlight I could see her features for the first time. I couldn't pinpoint the shape of her body. She was short and perhaps a little plump, but that could have been due to her clothes. I peered into her features and gestures. She bit her bottom lip, a gesture I've seen a million times. My ex-wife did it, and although I never told her about it, it was one of the sexiest things in the world to me. This woman had many of my ex-wife's traits, but she was older than Sarah. Sarah will be 32 on her next birthday. This woman was probably at least 35 or 40. There were other problems too. Sarah has green eyes. This woman has brown eyes that were somehow familiar to me, although I had never seen this woman before. Her hair color was also not the same as Sarah's deep brown. She had brown hair, but it could have been the dye. Her nose was also different, but somehow still familiar. Her mouth, however, from her lips to the way she moved them, 
was 100% Sarah. I was sure that I knew this girl. I began to remember Sarah's cousins. I knew that Sarah only had one sister, and she was also much younger than this woman. Damn, Dad, she said. Do you take so long to think? I looked at her again, and the first thought that came to my mind was that this woman was crazy. My daughter, Tina, is only three years old. I'm 33. This woman is at least 35 or 40. This means that I was born when she was seven or eight. It's impossible that I could be her father. I'm not your father, I said sharply. Damn, she said. You don't know how much it hurts. That's why Jake is so broken. Dad, look me straight in the eyes and tell me who I am. I moved closer to her, although I was still afraid that she was up to something. I looked at her and she smiled. I took her hand and looked at her. It's a scam, she said. Tina had a small birthmark on her left wrist, and there it was. But it was more than a birthmark. It was the way she stood, smiled, her eyes, her lips. Everything told me that this woman was somehow my three-year-old daughter growing into an adult. My heart began to beat faster. I thought I was going to faint. For a few moments, I thought I might be going crazy. Maybe it was all just a dream. But she just stood in front of me, smiling. Then she reached out her hands and just grabbed me. I think she caught me so off guard with her revelation that my shock overcame my preparedness. But she didn't attack me. She just hugged me. God, Dad, do you know how much I missed this? We haven't hugged like that in a long time, she said. I'm going to need you to do this a lot more often before I die. Tina, what do you mean before I die? I asked. What is this all about? Who are you? Dad, can we please go into your house and talk, she asked. I nodded slowly. I knew that from everything I know about life in general, I should never let some strange woman into my apartment, but somehow it felt right. As soon as we got settled, she quickly stood up and ran into my kitchen, grabbing two bottles of soda and a bag of chips. Can we sit on your balcony, she asked. I nodded and we went outside. The air is so strange, she said. I looked at her confused and began to reconsider my decision to let her in. She unscrewed the cap of her soda and took a sip. Her body shook. I smiled. I've always had the same reaction to sipping Pepsi. Oh my God, she said. I can't believe it's still legal here. Dad, don't let me drink too much of this. I need to be okay while I try to convince you. Again, I just shook my head and smiled. Okay, first of all, I have to tell you that you won't believe most of what I'm about to tell you, she said. But all you have to do is look at me and you will know. You already know in your heart who I am, but I need to convince you to make the right decision. I will only be here for a short time, 12 hours maximum, and I really wanted to see my mother too and myself and Jakey too. Dad, if you haven't figured it out yet, I am your daughter. I am Tina Elizabeth Reed, I am your daughter with your wife, Sarah Jane Reed. Only here I am from 40 years in the future. A lot has changed by my time. Dad, throughout, in all this time, there have been a few people who have been key to ensuring that things in the world do not get out of control. In my time, we are facing the end of humanity. Wait, wait, what the hell, I exclaimed. I've seen this movie a hundred times and it never ends well. This is where you ask me for donations to help you build a time machine or some bullshit to save the world, right? No, Dad, she smiled. I already have it. Do you have a time machine? I asked. Of course, she said. Well, it's not exactly a time machine. It's an iPhone app. I looked at her like she was crazy. Do you still have an iPhone 40 years in the future? I asked. Dad... Since the 50th president in 2036, it has been decided that since corporations have all legal doc statuses and rights of individuals, a corporation should have the right to run for president. Apple became president in 2040, and since then every US citizen has been given an iPhone implant at birth. Of course, the time travel app is illegal and must be installed via a jailbroken iPhone. Jakey invented it. That's part of the problem and that's why you're the only one who can fix it. Tina, if you are my daughter, I said, 
then please don't mention this boy. Dad, there are some things you really should know, she said. Can you start with why you're dying? I asked. She smiled. You really care about me, don't you? If you're Tina, I care about you more than anyone in the world, I said. Then why did you leave us? She asked. Tina, are you crazy? I asked. I visit you at least once a week, if not more often. You do it in this time period, she said. You will be very different later in life. May I continue? A lot has changed in my time. Damn it, Dad, I don't have time for this. I'll just show you, she said. She grabbed my hand and pulled me, the soda, and the chips back into my apartment and then out. She led me to my Mustang. Perfect, she said. Wait, let me guess. You're going to use my Mustang as a time machine, like that DeLorean in Back to the Future, right? Who's wearing what? she asked. You know in the movie Back to the Future they used a DeLorean sports car to go fast enough to get into the time stream? She looked at me like I was crazy when she's the one talking about time machines. I believe the DeLorean went 60 miles an hour in about 9 seconds. My Mustang goes to 60 miles an hour in less than 5 seconds, so that initial acceleration should help us get into the time stream faster. Dad, time travel isn't about speed, it's about using Tachyon particles correctly, she said. Besides, I'm not going to actually take you to the future. I'm going to project 3D video holograms onto your windshield so you can see what my timeline will be like. Damn, I said out loud. What's wrong, Dad? She asked. I really wanted to see the 2052 Mustang, I said. She frowned strangely. Okay, she said. Before we begin, take me to see myself. Tina, it's almost midnight, I said. And isn't there some kind of law that different aspects of the same person being in one place at the same time, create some kind of time paradox and destroy the space-time continuum. Dad, you need to stop watching all those old sci-fi movies. It's the biggest crap I've ever heard. I've already gone back and talked to myself a few times. I even hugged myself once when I thought I needed it. Really necessary. What you're telling me is all this nonsense about how two copies of the same physical substance in close proximity will destroy the world, right? Well, um, really, I said. That's what they said in Star Wars. No, Dad, that's simply not true. Anyway, I want to see myself as a little girl, so let's go. But you know what? If there are any seismic disturbances or the weather changes as we approach, I will retreat. We got into my car, and I had to fasten her seat belt. She smiled at me. Oh yeah, you don't have inertial dampers yet, do you? She said with a smile. It's so cool. Her smile disappeared as the car started moving. She grabbed the seat as if her life depended on it. When we got onto the highway, where there was little traffic, I pressed a button, and a radar detector appeared on the display. I changed gear and stepped on the gas. Dad? Why are we going so fast? She screamed. Is this illegal? What is that thing on your dashboard? Can you please slow down? Honey, we're only going a hundred miles an hour, I said. We haven't yet unlocked its potential. Dad, I don't want to die so early, she said. Please slow down. I feel like my face is going to fall off, and I'm being pushed back out of the seat. Yes, I said. Isn't this wonderful? No, she said. So I slowed down to 70 miles an hour. She still wasn't having much fun. Tina, am I still driving too fast? I asked. Yes, Dad, she said. This car isn't even controlled by a computer. You drive it yourself manually. What if something happens or you get distracted? Darling, how fast do you drive these days? I asked. During Obama's second term, all handheld vehicles were limited to 40 miles per hour, she said. Are you kidding? I said. No, I'll never vote for Barack Obama again. First he castrated the Camaro when he saved GM. Then he castrated everyone else. Who is Barack Obama? She asked. I'm talking about the president, Sasha Obama. Oh my God, I said. His child also grew up and became president. Hasn't he caused enough trouble already? 
Tina, I love you, honey, but I can't drive 40. Even Sammy Hagger can barely handle 55 and 40. I could walk. Eventually, we arrived at Sarah's house. We parked nearby and Tina raised her hand. Her hand began to glow and she pointed her finger at the windshield. A projection on the windshield showed what was happening inside the building. When she found her mother's apartment, she zoomed in and I saw Sarah sitting there on the couch. She seemed to be reading a book. Tina switched to another room and we saw her stepbrother sleeping in his crib. He looks so innocent, doesn't he? She asked. It's hard to believe what he would do to us. What? I asked. We'll talk about this later, Dad, she said. She then switched to the room and saw herself. She slept in her room, hugging her teddy bear tightly. Looking at herself, she turned to me. You still keep it, don't you? She asked. What? I asked again. Mom always talked about you, she said, even after you stopped visiting us. She always told me that there were three things that always made me smile at you. Seeing me, seeing your Mustang, whatever it is, and seeing her. She told me that she knew your marriage was over when you stopped smiling when you saw her. She was sure that meant you didn't love her anymore. I lowered my head. You still love her, don't you, Daddy? She asked. Even now, when you start dating other women, you still love Mom. She switched back to the living room, where Sarah sat with her legs tucked under her, reading a book. Tina zoomed in again, and I felt even sadder. Sarah was actually looking at a photo album. I recognized it from the cover. These were photos we took when it was just the two of us, before we had kids. I wondered why she would waste time looking at photos of us together. As if she read my thoughts, Tina answered my question. Because she always told me it was the best time of her life, she said. She should never have shared you with anyone else, not even Jakey and me. Honey, this is a little depressing, I said. Can we move on? Of course, Dad, I still saw what I wanted, she said. We drove away from the building and I found a secluded place in the forest, away from people. Tina raised her hand, and I stopped her. Honey, does it hurt you? I asked. She looked at me in surprise and smiled. Of course not, Dad, she said. Everyone has all sorts of implants. Some are cosmetic, some are functional. She grabbed her soda and pointed her hand at the windshield. How do you like that, Dad? She said. Here's my baby. The family tradition continues, right? What is this thing? I asked. She circled the object. It's something like a machine, isn't it? I asked. The wheels are so small. Damn, she's all so small. Please don't tell me my daughter drives a Toyota. I looked at her as if I was ashamed of her. Dad, she said irritably, I just showed you what you wanted to see. She looked around the front of the car, and where there should have been a radiator grill, if the car had one, there was a horse. He didn't appear to be running. Please tell me it's not what I think, I cried. Yes, Dad, she said. This is my brand new GMFC Mustang. It's a Shelby. The car looked like a smart car with a Mustang sticker on the front. Kill me now, I said. Just take a gun and shoot me in the forehead. Who is GMFC and why do they make Mustangs? GMFC is General Motors' Ford Chrysler, Dad, she said. In 2020, they were tired of all the competition with other automakers. They just banded together and drove everyone else out of the market. Now they are the only auto company other than boutique manufacturers. Kill me now, I said. Okay, Dad, she said. What else do you need to see before I start my presentation? Show me what cities look like, I said. I observed a scene that looked like a shopping mall. Tina, show me something exciting, like a major city, not a shopping mall, I said. Dad, this is New York City at rush hour, she said. But no he does it look like a shopping mall, I asked. We built domes over all the cities more than 20 years ago, she replied. Where are all the cars, I asked. Dad, most people don't really need cars. Public transport is faster cleaner and more efficient, she said, sounding like an advert for mass transit. What about personal freedom and the pioneering spirit that built this country? I asked. 
Well, you are free to do anything that is not prohibited by law, she said, and you are free to explore the entire world through the transit tubes. At least in my time you can. Where are all the different people? I asked. What about the differences? She looked at me like I was crazy. Dad, what are you talking about? Tina, where are the fat people? Where are the black people? Where are the elderly? Every damn person in that crowd looks the same. Dad, wait, I'll explain everything, she said. How is it that no one is short? I asked. Who the hell are they teasing at school? Dad, no one is teasing, she said. Bullying is a criminal offense. Anyway, when you were a child, society considered it strange or wrong to marry someone of a different race or faith, remember? She asked. By the time I was born, it wasn't big news anymore, it became the norm. Over time, all the racial features just got mixed up. So now there are no more dark-skinned African Americans. There are no more almond-eyed Asians. We all look the same in some way. Then, of course, doctors perform DNA mapping during pregnancy so that babies who are expected to be born below or above optimal height are corrected before birth. Each is also given a metabolic implant during adolescence that stabilizes their metabolism. It analyzes their weight and gives them an appetite suppressant if they are in danger of becoming overweight or makes them feel hungry if they are below their optimal weight. Realistically, the only difference between people now is hair color, and since it can be dyed according to desire. Well, like you said, with the exception of the older people, everyone looks the same in a way. I think that's why most famous stars and supermodels want to marry older people. There are so many differences between them, and variety is the spice of life, Dad. They also banned alcohol, tobacco, caffeine, and all stimulants, as well as all sweeteners, she said, taking a long sip of her Pepsi. It's so delicious. I can't believe it's still legal. Kill me now, I said. I really don't want to be alive on your time. She switched to another scene. She showed a large house on the outskirts of the city. An elderly man, who was still in excellent shape, was running slowly around the perimeter of the site. At regular intervals he passed armed guards who all nodded politely at him and then shook their heads as he passed. Who is it, Tina? I asked. Why does his house look like it's fenced off from the rest of the other cities? Because he is, Dad, she said. He has enough money and power to just say fuck you to the rules and laws. He does what he wants when he wants. As we watched, he finished his run and a couple of young, beautiful models rushed towards him. They seemed to be arguing about who he was talking to and who he wanted to spend time with. Okay, I want to be in his place, I said. As I watched, I noticed that even though he had everything one could want, he was not happy. The two women did their best to get his attention, but he barely paid them any attention. If I didn't know better, I would think he was depressed, I said. Very good, Dad, she said. I don't understand, I said. Why is he so depressed? He did the stupidest thing in the world and lost everything, she said. Let me guess, I said. Some stupid merger didn't happen, and now instead of five billion, he only has four. To hell with him, he's an idiot. Tina laughed and even touched my shoulder, the way she does now as a child. We'll get back to him, Dad, she said. As I looked, the screen changed again, and I saw the grave. She pointed to the gravestone, and I saw a name on it. When I saw the name on the gravestone, I got angry. What the hell is this? I asked. The name on the gravestone was Jake Reed Jr. Did I have another child somewhere afterwards? I asked. No, Dad, she said. So you're saying Sarah's baby is buried with my damn name? I hissed. I'm sorry, Tina. I love you more than I can ever show, but I hate her son. Why, Dad? She asked. Because every time I hear about him or see him, it's like a slap in my face, and he's a reminder of what his father stole from me. What did his father steal from you? She asked. My wife, my marriage. He just stole everything, I replied sharply. Think about that too, Dad, she said. Should I keep a list of everything we come back to and what I have to think about? I asked. If you want, she said. Even as she said this, 
The screen changed again to show another burial site. As she approached the gravestone, I had a completely different reaction this time. Even in my time, we got divorced more than a year ago. I don't know why I cried when I saw Sarah's name on the tombstone. I cried even more when I saw the inscription and I looked at Tina angrily. She raised her hands. She made me promise, she said. The caption read, Sarah Reed. The second line read, A good wife at last. The last line read, There is no more shame. That's how she felt her whole life after you two broke up, Tina said. And Dad, you did it to her. Don't blame me, girl, I replied sharply. Your mother's actions are responsible for what happened to us, not me. Tina laughed again. She waved her hand and then showed me another burial site. What are we doing, Tina, guessing the grave, I asked. I looked at the tombstone anyway. It was Kennard Davenport, boss Sarah, and also the man who got her pregnant. I smiled. What happened to this, I asked. Why does his grave look so old? He just disappeared, Tina said. A lot of people think that Jakey had something to do with it. But he doesn't. Davenport died after Jakey, but before him, actually. Tina, this doesn't make sense at all, I said. How could he die after Jakey, but before him? She started talking. Let me guess, I said. We'll get back to this. The screen showed a room with an old woman on the bed. I saw that it was Sarah and that she was much older than she is now. She was talking to Tina. There's no point in your father and I living longer than our baby, she said. But soon I will be with him, and perhaps in a few years your father will join us. Mom, with the way things are going now, we're probably all going to die soon. Half the damn world is already brain dead thanks to Jakey's creations. Mom, why didn't you ever tell Dad the truth? Tina asked. Honey, what good would it do? I hurt the man I love more than can be humanly forgiven. What if he forgave me? Then he would be a laughing stock for the rest of his life. How hard that would be for me, I deserved it, she said. Yes, Mom, but did I deserve it? Did Jakey deserve it? I really think that's what twisted them both. Promise me you'll never tell him, Tina, Sarah said. Jakey is dead, so this won't help him anymore. It will only hurt your father even more so promise me you won't tell him. Before Tina could respond, Sarah left. I couldn't hold back my tears. I started crying again. Tina looked at me. She saw that I was going through all this very hard. Perhaps it was harder for me than she expected. Tina, can we get to the point now? I asked. I'm sure you didn't time travel just to make me feel pathetic, or did you? Dad, I... She began and then hesitated. Dad, you've already told me several times that you don't want to live in my world. I nodded. Well, Dad, you already live in it, she said. But you don't have to. You're the only person on Earth who has the potential to stop this. I've been moving back and forth in time for the past few weeks, and it's all up to you. Tina, what are you talking about? I asked again. I started to get angry. Dad, in every era, there are people who shape the direction the world will go. Henry Ford put the world on wheels. A few years later, the era of aviation began with the Wright brothers. Later, Bill Gates did not usher in the computer era, but his company shaped it. Computers and software existed before that, but Microsoft took computers out of the hands of nerds and put them in every living room, then in our pockets, and now they're under our skin. Dad. Jakey did the same thing in my era. My brother was a twisted genius, and he changed the world. If Jakey had been less twisted, maybe things would have turned out differently. But the way they are now, or at least at least as in my time, Jakey is dead, and the world may not last another twenty years after him. Before I came back here, I went to the future, but we'll talk about that. She began. Let me guess, I chuckled. We will talk about it later. Anyway, Dad, Jakey, like you, was obsessive and brilliant. But where you used your tragedy and focused all your attention on business and making money, he used his in another direction. You both are like two sides of the same thing. Coins. 
you became bitter and eventually sad about what happened. So after years of dating women like the one you had last night, business became your only reason to live. You focused on making money before everything else. Years later, when the bitterness had gone, you were just a sad, lonely old man. You had all the money in the world, but no one to spend it on. You knew or assumed that everyone around you was only there for the money. What you wanted most were the people you truly loved, but they were not there. Jakey, on the other hand, was just like his father. He had the ability to concentrate on one thing to the exclusion of everything else. Because of his childhood, what he wanted most was to be loved. This is what he was denied as a child. His mother was broken and his father never gave him time. He longed for his father's approval. So he took what he wanted and in trying to create something for himself, he changed the world forever, but it was out of his control. What does it look like? I asked. And why are you connecting me and that boy? I have nothing to do with his father ignoring him. Davenport was a jerk. Everyone knows that. You can't expect me to try to fix what he screwed up. Daddy, damn it, she screamed. I don't have time to continue to lead you by the hand in baby steps. Yes, Davenport was a jerk, but you're a bigger jerk. In fact, you may be the biggest jerk on the planet. You, Dad, not Davenport, are the reason we can all die. I was amazed at the rage in her voice. What have I done? I asked. Well, for starters, you keep interrupting me, she replied sharply. Dad, Jakey started experimenting with robotics and artificial intelligence when he was just 12. At first he made stupid little things like his talking box. That thing made him rich. It was a box that he could actually talk to. It was a very primitive AI. She could connect to the internet, get information, and have real conversations with him. He could ask her questions, and she would answer them. For a boy with no friends and no attention from others, she became his best friend. Then he started working on cases. Because of his genius and success with AI, he was able to form partnerships with several other inventors and use or license their products. I remember moving back to my mom's house when I was about 20. I was already in college, and Jakey was still at home. There was a woman with him. Dad, I was sitting in the same room with her, and I was amazed at how beautiful she was. I thought she was just trying to hit on Jake because of his intelligence. When I tried to talk to Jakey about it, he just smiled and called her into the room. He asked her what she would do for him. She said she would do whatever he asked. Jake asked her if she would take a knife and kill herself. She nodded her head. Jake handed her the knife, and I swear if I hadn't grabbed her, she would have done it. When I grabbed her wrist, she was still trying to resist, to cut her throat. She was stronger than hell, and Jakey just stood there and laughed. Finally, he told her to stop. And then he did the strangest thing. He told her to switch off. And she just collapsed on the floor. My young one me brother, when he was 17, made himself a robot companion that was so realistic that I couldn't tell it apart from a real person. Of course she was unique. She had a pulse and was warm to the touch. She also had full AI. It took many years before robots like hers became widely available. Once I understood what it was for and what it was, I began to look at it more critically and I could tell the difference. But over the next 10 years, Jakey got richer and richer, and his robots got better and better. Jakey's company made labor-saving robots and work robots of all kinds. Eventually, it got to the point where robots were doing most of the work for most people. We started getting fat and lazy. Jakey helped us again. He started programming robots to take care of us. So if you need to go out and get some exercise, your robot will make you go on a bike ride or run. Think about it. Your robot will record your favorite TV shows for you, and then make you go out of the house and go for a bike ride. Dad, after a while, no one needed to work, think, or do anything. Robots even assembled robots. So very soon after that, robots started making higher-level decisions that humans were too bitter or too indifferent to make. We were served, like stupid children. Like you, Dad, Jakey was able to see things from a broader perspective. He realized that everything had gone too far and that he needed to turn it all off. But the robots evolved. 
It wasn't like in The Terminator. There was no judgment day when machines became self-aware and took over the planet. It was very subtle, but also much more comprehensive. AI computers that controlled banks, roads, traffic, manufacturing, and food were all networked to serve us more smoothly. Five years in the future from my time, no one needed to work. Ten years from my time, the human race has degenerated, and our intelligence and creativity have suffered greatly. Fifteen years from my time, humanity tried to take back control of the machines and lost. Twenty years from my time, time was blocked. I literally couldn't get there or further. Perhaps it was the limits of the technology I inherited from Jakey, or perhaps there was nothing left in the world. I really don't know, but Dad, only you can take us away, save this. Why me? I asked. What does this have to do with me anyway? Tina flashed the images on my windshield back to the sad old man and his two blonde companions. Those women are with the old man, I said. That's why he doesn't care about them. They're robots, aren't they? She shook her head sadly. No, Dad, she said. They are people. These are two 20-year-old women who love you. You are simply not able to reciprocate their feelings because after you lost your mother, after you found out the truth, you are simply not capable of loving someone. I, I asked. Is that old man me? She nodded. Okay, so I'm a sad old man, I said. I did my best to hide my shock that I was the old man in the video. I still don't understand how this is my fault. You should probably talk to Davenport. It won't help, Dad, she said. Davenport will disappear soon. His body will never be found. And he really has nothing to do with any of this. But you said that your stepbrother was going crazy from a lack of love and attention from his parents. I had nothing to do with that directly. Well, your mom loved me, and I have to admit, I still love her. How does that work? Am I responsible for what your stepbrother does? Dad, I'm breaking a promise to mom by telling you this, but in the end, if you're happy, it won't matter. Jakey isn't my half-brother. He's my brother, Dad. I don't mean that I call him so, or that we grew up together. He's my real, physical, DNA-matching brother. He's your son, Dad. In my time, you only found out after he died. But your mother never, I began. She knew, didn't she? Yes, Dad, Mom knew from the very beginning, she said. Then why doesn't she? I began. Because, Dad, she loved you so much. She spent the rest of her life loving you. She just couldn't move on. She didn't want you to stay with her when you didn't want to because of the baby. How much it would be for her if she saw you every day, knowing that you are not together because you feel the same way, but because you had to be there for the sake of the child. But, I said quietly, Dad, she just wasn't capable of doing anything to hurt you. She thought what happened to her was enough pain for you for the rest of your life. She didn't want to add to that. You know she called you my husband until the day I died, right? If she loved me so much, then why did she cheat on me with her boss? I asked. Dad, Mom didn't really cheat on you, she said. She was set up by Davenport. They went on a business trip and mom never trusted him or any man around her. Even when they had dinner with clients or colleagues, mom never drank anything stronger than water, and she always made sure it was from a new sealed bottle. Dad, mom woke up the morning after one of those business dinners and found Davenport in her bed. She knew he had sex with her, and the first thing she did was grab the glasses off the table and put them in her suitcase. When she got home, she checked them and made sure the drinks were clean. Some of her colleagues at work heard about what happened and started propositioning her because they thought she regularly did this kind of thing. It took her years to find out what happened, and by then you had already broken up. After finding out about it, she said, she became more depressed. It turned out that Davenport saw how Mom was watching her drinks. He put something in her food. Of course, Mom, that's how she was. When she came home, she came clean, no matter how much it hurt her. She told you about it. Dad, you exploded. I'm sure you remember that. And I know you were hurt, too. But you just didn't think about it. Would a woman who wanted to cheat on you come to you in tears and tell you that this happened? I looked at the floor. 
Dad, Davenport didn't get Mom pregnant. She was already pregnant when she went on the trip. She just didn't know about it at the time. Jakey is your son, but you were so angry at your mom that she just never gave herself a chance or even a reason to tell you. You realized this later in life, but by then it was too damn late to do anything. Think about it. Instead of receiving support and care from the man she loves, she received anger and contempt. She lived her life thinking about how she hurt you instead of being loved by the man she never stopped loving. Jackie, your son, grew up without a father's love or example to teach him what kind of man he should be. His mother was so heartbroken at losing the love of her life that she showed him no love either. To get the love he wanted most, Jakey had to try to create it. His relationships with people were tenuous at best. He just never trusted people. He had complete confidence in his machines. In the end, he was disappointed because, first of all, he realized that programming, no matter how difficult it was, simply was not love. And the robots he trusted ended up killing him to stop him from taking them offline. Now the whole world may be at stake. But Daddy, it's not too late. So you want me to jump forward in time with you and fix your brother? I asked. No, Daddy, she said. That wouldn't be the best option. Okay, I said. I'm still crying over what Ford is planning to do with the 2015 Mustang. It looks more like a Taurus than a Mustang. They are going to destroy the image of my car for the sake of modernization. I'm really not ready for this. Look at that thing they call a Mustang in your day. She was laughing. So what you want me to do is go back in time with you and stop your mom from cheating on me, I asked. No, Daddy, she said sadly. I can't let you do that either. Why not, I asked. We could have made sure none of this happened. It could have saved everything. Dad, I was there, she said. In the version of you back then, his head was so deep in his ass that he couldn't do anything except spew nonsense. He kept telling me that he had no reason to take the traitor back. If she were a real woman, she would never allow herself to be in a position where someone could take advantage of her. Looking at my daughter, I saw that she was telling me the truth again, and I remembered several drunken tirades in which I said almost the same words to friends who were trying to help me forget Sarah. Maybe I could go back in time with you and meet my old self and explain it to him myself, I suggested. Damn it, Daddy, she spat. No time travel for you. Why the hell not? I asked. I wanted to go another time. I saw her. I knew it was possible, and I really wanted to experience it. I've been into science fiction all my life. I love technology, and I wanted to see the future. I also wanted that damn Star Trek feeling where I go back in time and feel superior and better than the people of that time period. I could just imagine pulling out my iPhone and completely freaking people out in the 80s. Right before I went back to my timeline, I did this thing with Mr. Fernanchi Spock's hand and said, Live long and prosper. Hell, I might invent Dos Equis. I really could be the most interesting man in the world. My own daughter tried to take away my ability to time travel. Because I love you, Daddy, she said. Tears streamed down her cheeks. One of us is enough. Dad, tachyon particles are deadly. They eventually kill all living tissue they come into contact with. Time travel is deadly. That's why Jakey abandoned his research in this field. I'm already stricken with cancer. I just looked at her and realized what she must have gone through during all these time transitions. So why are you? I began. Damn dilemma, Dad, she said. On the one hand, my world is about to end. My family is torn apart. The robots are trying to protect us to the death. When we try to take control of our lives, they won't let us because they don't think we're capable of taking care of ourselves. They'll kill us. To continue to take care of us, some psychotic nannies. Even if the world doesn't end, which it will, I would rather die than live like this. I don't have a world to go back to. Even if I didn't have cancer, this world will end before I get to the end of my life. On the other hand, if you fix something here, this timeline will never happen. With your gift for business and the way you care about people, keeping Jakey's genius in check, even if he gets into robotics, it will never get to the point where robots completely rule our lives. 
Jake won't have to resort to extremes because he has, I'll have all the love I need from an early age. Hell, maybe he'll go into a completely different field. I'll grow up in a different and better world. Maybe even one where I can fall in love and have kids. Dad, if everything goes well and you handle your part, it will be as if I never existed. The version of me here will grow up happy and balanced, just like Jake. You and Mom will live your lives together, happier, and all the world will be a better place. But honey, I don't want you to not exist, I said. Dad, that's so sweet. And that's the next thing I need to talk to you about, she said. You always loved me so much that I felt it. I need you to share that love with Mom and Jakey. And please don't try to make this timeline's version of me like me. Let her grow in her own way. She might dye her hair pink and drive a Camaro, but she loves you and she's your daughter. Damn, I said. If Ford ruins the 2015 Mustang like they say on the internet, I might actually drive a Camaro. Seriously, Daddy, she said, shaking her head. But this part is important. You can't tell anyone about me or what will happen in the future. But honey, if I can't tell anyone about you, then how can I improve my relationship with your mother? I asked. Tina just started laughing hysterically. Dad, this is the easy part. This woman loves you like there is no tomorrow. If you just showed up in the middle of the night, she'd be happy. Don't worry. I'll watch you for a few minutes while I prepare for oblivion. For what? Dad, I take very strong painkillers for cancer. If you succeed, the next time I jump, I'll just jump into oblivion. I won't be there anymore. My consciousness will mix with the version of me here and my timeline will not happen. On the other hand, if things don't work out for you, I'll jump back into my screwed up world. I'll have to try something else, but each jump gets more painful. Maybe you'll almost succeed and I might have to do one more little thing, in which case you'll probably see me again. If I had returned earlier than this time, you would not have remembered me. If I came back after this, you would do it. So, hug me goodbye, Daddy, and for both of our sakes, I hope you never see me again. I would really like to rest. There are a few surprises, so watch out for them. My heart was beating like crazy, breaking the silence of the night room. I woke up, sweaty and nervous, like I'd just run a marathon. My breathing was shallow and my head was racing with thoughts. I sat on the bed, holding his head in his hands, trying to calm down. The heartbeat gradually slowed down and reality began to return. The realization that it was only a dream filled me with relief. I realized that I had a chance to change everything, a chance to provide my children with a happy future. I looked at my watch. It was almost two o'clock in the morning. I shrugged and got into the car. I drove back to Sarah's apartment. I waved to the doorman. I've been here a few times at night, so I knew both the night guy and the day doorman very well. I knocked on Sarah's door carefully because I didn't want to wake the children. There was no answer. Then I realized that it was already very late. I tried calling her. The phone rang three times before she answered. Jake, what happened? The concern in her voice was very obvious. I guess since I never called her unless it was about the kids, she thought something was seriously wrong. Sarah, I'm standing outside your apartment, I said. I heard the phone drop, and the next thing I heard was the sound of the locks being removed from the door. She opened the door and looked very sleepy. I entered the apartment, and she continued to look at me. I took her hand and led her back to the back of the apartment. I entered Tina's room and kissed her on the cheek. Then I went into Jake's room and kissed him too. This caused Sarah to react, but she didn't say anything. I took her hand, closed Jake's door, and led her to the bedroom. I pushed her onto the bed and started kissing her. She melted in my kisses. She grabbed the back of my head and pulled me closer. As I kissed her cheeks, neck and chest, she sighed contentedly. I licked both her nipples in turn, and she shuddered with anticipation. I started touching her through her nightgown, and she lifted it, giving me access. When I looked at us in the mirror, I had to laugh. I mean, I was still wearing my shirt and socks. I lay next to Sarah, whose hair was disheveled and her nightgown was bunched around her neck. She cried. Sarah, I'm sorry, I said. Did I hurt you? 
No, Jake, she said. I, I miss this so much. I kissed her tenderly on the cheek. Next time it will be better, I said. But tonight was about something else. Are you saying it will happen again, she asked. When, I want to be ready for this. I looked at her strangely. Sarah, I think you misunderstood, I said. Her face darkened. I should have known, she said. Huge crystal tears flowed from her eyes again, and I kissed them. Honey, you're acting like this is a sex call, like I'll just walk in and want to have sex with you. But that's not what it's about, I said. Then what about, Jake, she asked. Sarah, don't ask me why or how, but I know everything. I know what really happened to you, and I even know how. I know about Jake. I know that Davenport is not his father. This is not about me apologizing for not realizing that you would never do what I thought. It's about thanking you for loving me so much and to let you know that even though I acted like a jerk, I love you just as much. This is about telling you that I want us and our kids to get back together as a family and I don't care what will anyone think of this. Even if we have to move to another city or something, I want us to be together again. Are you okay with that? She was speechless. She just nodded her head and hugged me. I held her close to me, and we fell asleep, hugging each other. When I woke up the next morning, with my arms still wrapped around Sarah, two small faces looked at me in shock. Tina smiled knowingly. Jake also smiled in surprise. Dad, I had to help Jake out of the crib, Tina said. I should have told him you were back. Back, Jake repeated, imitating his older sister. I extended my hands to him, and he tried to walk towards me and fell on his butt. I picked him up, and he smiled. Dad, he shouted. All the noise and movement woke Sarah up. She looked at me and smiled the biggest, brightest smile I've ever seen. I was afraid it was a dream. I didn't want to wake up and see it was gone, she said. But you're really here. She hugged me again. I have one thing to do today, and then we'll go look at the house. I said, but you and I need to talk. Whatever, honey, she said. No, Sarah, whatever we want. I wanted to talk about the fact that I will soon stop paying you child support, I said. Of course, you just had to ask, she said. Sarah, don't you want to know why, I asked. No, she said. Sarah, because you don't pay alimony for your wife, I said. She just smiled. Then she realized what I meant. Jake, you can't, she said. Why not, I asked. Are you refusing me? No, never, she said. But people will. I don't care about them, I said. I left the house, leaving Sarah happier than she had been in a long time. And I was happy too. I reunited my family and found a son I didn't know I had. It was like a release from all the sadness and anger that I was carrying inside of me. But in their place, a new anger appeared. I drove to the building where Sarah worked when we were married. I waved to all the guards and a few people I knew. I went up to her former office. I even knew the woman who replaced Sarah as Davenport's assistant. Hi, Connie, I said. How are you? Excellent, Mr. Dis Reed, she said. How's Sarah? Oh, sorry, I shouldn't have asked. Connie, everything is great with Sarah, I smiled. We are looking for a new home. Are you back together? She asked. I simply nodded. It's good to see that things worked out for someone. For someone, she said. Connie, maybe you should go back to your old job in the secretariat, I said. Unlikely, she said. I've asked him about this several times, but he doesn't want to let me go. And if I insist, he'll probably fire me. Well, he's waiting for me, I lied. He called and said he had some of Sarah's things and I wasn't going to let her be alone with him. I was going to kick Davenport's ass. He was much bigger than me, but I was going to hurt him. I entered the office, but he was not there. I waited five minutes, then I returned to his office. I really can't wait for him, Connie, I said. If he ever shows up, can you just tell him I stopped by? Of course I will, she said. She stood up and walked into the office, looking around, looking for him. She knocked on his bathroom door and opened it when no one answered. I really thought he was there, she said as I left. 
From that day on, my family and I were fine. A few years later, an aunt I didn't know existed left me almost half a million dollars in her will. I knew it was a different Tina. I used the money to start my business. I called it Reed and Son Enterprises. We specialized in business facilitation. For his eighth birthday, I bought Jakey a robot. He looked at me as if I was crazy. I asked him if he wanted to return it and exchange it. He nodded and we went to the toy store. In the end, he chose two toys instead of an expensive robot. He received a scale model of the Mustang and a baseball bat. He now plays first base for his high school team. He wants to take over the family business after college. Years later, when we talked about that birthday, he told me that he didn't want me to think he didn't appreciate the robot, but he thought it was creepy. He thought it was strange. Sarah and I had two more children before settling down to enjoy life together. I took on lighter work and let Jakey handle most of the day-to-day -day operations of the business. 45. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.